And with all of that, I am very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Mariel Tolhurst Cleaver. She discovered a love of paediatric emergency medicine while she was travelling in Australia, of course. Um, and she now leads the trainee, um, she's now the trainee representative on the Peruki Executive Committee. All of our speakers today are talking about Peruki, which is the paediatric emergency research network in the UK and Ireland. So I'm very pleased to introduce Mariel. Hi, and um, thank you. So, I spy with my little eye, something beginning with R. Any guesses? Uh, research, maybe? Or even possibly red eye, but I'll come on to that later. Now, I'm honoured to start the Peruki session today to talk about my experience developing research as a trainee. I'll put this out there. I am not a hardcore scientific researcher, I'm not in an academic post. In fact, I was so undecided even about science at school that I took two humanities for A-level. And not infrequently, I still sometimes think whether I should uh, have been a history teacher. So, with that in mind, how did I, how, why am I here today talking to you? I don't know how I'm really going to give you any advice about um, research, but I'm going to try and tell you about my journey um, developing the first trainee-led um, Peruki research project, how I got involved with that, and um, what we did that was successful, what was not so successful. And hopefully, if anyone else is like me, uh, research naive, then give you some tips to get involved. So my journey began um, by answering a WhatsApp message from Tom, who is going to talk to you shortly. Um, on the UK Paediatric Emergency Medicine Trainee Group. So we've got a group with, um, there's about 70 of us, I think, uh, on there, who do paediatric emergency medicine as a subspecialty across the UK. And um, Tom put up a message on there saying, oh, would anyone like to get involved in a trainee research project? So um, I had been an individual member of Peruki for a while, um, which, just as a little uh, aside, if you want to be an individual member, you can join. Just go to the website and you can fill in a form. <laughs> so um, I'd been an individual member for a while and I knew the kind of things they were doing and I'd recruited some patients at work into studies that we were running. And I'd thought that I would like to get more involved with research, but I didn't know how or how to begin or who to ask or whatever. So when I saw this message from Tom, I thought, oh, great, and replied straight away. Now, Tom at the time was the trainee representative for Peruki, and um, he uh, basically was looking for a group to try and run um, a trainee-led project. So he set up a teleconference, and we all had a chat. All the people who said they were interesting had a, had a chat about um, the kind of ideas um, of what we might look at and the kind of thing we might do, and he took that back to the executive board and um, my idea was actually picked. So I was delighted about that, and then I was informed that it seemed sensible, that it, because it was my idea, I'd been nominated to lead the project, which I was slightly overwhelmed by, to be honest. Um, maybe a little bit nervous. Um, but yeah, so that's how all that sort of started. So why am I telling you this? Well. The point, I think, is that it was 18 months into the project before I met um, some of the people I was working with. And in fact, I've met Tom literally for the first time just now. And we've been <laughs> working together for nearly two years on this project. So my advice is that you don't need to um, know people locally or be able to meet people face to face to do research. Um, Anything is achievable now via digital media. Our entire project has been undertaken via teleconferences, WhatsApp, and emails. Um, and as I say, like, you know, there's one person on the team I still haven't met. So um, yeah, just get involved with digital media. You don't need to see people face to face. My second piece of advice is to, if at all possible, um, get the help or get involved with a research network. So. Um, 
for me, that's Peruki, because that's the UK and Ireland Research Network for Pediatric Emergency Medicine. But depending on where you live, that might be PREDICT or PECAN or PERN. Or if you're from a different specialty, um, like emergency medicine or general paediatrics, you know, there'll be research networks out there uh, that you can use as well. So what is the benefit of a research network? Well, it's really twofold. The first is that um, they can just give you invaluable advice um, about uh, developing your research, you know, um, your research design and the implementation of your research. Uh, and that might be informally via emails or a telephone conversation, um, or it might be via formal feedback. If you submit your research proposal and then they, they you know, they all look at it, the research steering committee in the case of Pruki look at that and they give you formal feedback so you can make changes. Um, and that all really helps to uh, make sure your research is as good as it can possibly be, good as it can possibly be. And the second thing is that um, they have this reach to their members and their sites uh, that is so useful. So, um, because you've got a body of people who are voluntarily involved with research. So they're already en engaged and committed and want to, you know, get involved. Um, so then when you need to either people to recruit for you or you want people to respond to something, you get access to all of them already. So I'm going to disagree slightly with Steve Jobs on this um, and say, I think the quote would be better saying, the only way to do great work is to be passionate about what you do. Now I say that because I put forward the topic uh, for the um, trainee project of periorbital cellulitis. Now that is not because I'm an expert in pediatric ophthalmology. In fact, it is not a spoiler alert to tell you that I am most definitely not an expert in pediatric ophthalmology. Um, but it's because I actually found the topic really frustrating. Now, why is that? It's because I am your average type A personality. There's probably a few in this room. I am a rule keeper, not a rule breaker. Um, so we have a clinical practice guideline for periorbital cellulitis where I work. And I find it so frustrating that we literally ignore it a large proportion of the time. Um, I just feel like if we have a guideline, it should be a useful guide. You know, we should follow it. Um, so it's not that the clinical reasoning for what we're doing is, is wrong. I think, you know, I think we're doing the right thing. Um, but it's because our guideline doesn't include any option to discharge patients or use oral antibiotics. So, um, so yeah, so I think... You don't need to necessarily have a topic that you love. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you have a topic that you love or you're really passionate about something, then that's great. But it could also be something that just really niggles you and gets under your skin. Whatever it is, find something that, that you have that passion for that, that, you know, that gives you that spark because that is what is going to give you the motivation to get a research project off the ground, which you know, isn't necessarily an easy thing to do. So I'm going to pause just... Uh, briefly to tell you a bit more about our actual project. So I'm sure you're all aware that periorbital cellulitis is a bacterial infection of the tissues anterior to the orbital septum. Unfortunately, it has the potential to extend posteriorly into the orbit, causing orbital cellulitis, which is a site-threatening emergency. And it can extend even further posteriorly, uh, intracranially, which is you know, potentially life-threatening. So clearly, the treatment of periorbital cellulitis must be sufficient to uh, avoid that progression. Unfortunately, our issue is that we don't know whether every case of periorbital cellulitis needs intravenous antibiotics for that. Um, I mean, from clinical experience, we, we suspect not, that the milder cases could be treated with oral antibiotics. But there's no evidence for that. So what did we do? Well, we decided that we would do a survey to all the Peruki sites, so that's across UK and Ireland, um, to try to look at the variation in practice of what we're doing as emergency physicians for children. We also asked um, that if any of these sites had a clinical practice guideline, could they send that to us so we could compare and contrast those guidelines um, and look at areas of consensus of opinion, but also areas, areas where we diverge. 
So now for a case. Now as part of our survey, uh, at the end of our survey, we had some like clinical vignettes. And this case is actually one of them. So I thought it might be fun today to see whether we got similar results in this room to that we got in the study. So we've got a six-year-old boy who has had 48 hours of pain around his right eye. Uh, his mum said it looked a bit red uh, and puffy yesterday, and it looks a bit worse today. Uh, assume from here on in, his left eye is normal. He is systemically well. Uh, he doesn't have a fever. He's got no um, problems with, uh, he's got no visual disturbance, and he's got no pain on eye movement. Now, on examination of the eye, you have a look at it, you can visualize the eye. The pupils, the eye movements, and um, the acuity are all normal. Uh, the, there's erythema of um, the upper and lower lids, and there's some moderate periorbital edema. So my first question is, I hope this is going to work, um, do you give no treatment? Would you give oral antibiotics, or would you give IV antibiotics? Oh, wow, well, let's see. If that, so I'll give you, give you all a minute. I'll just wait. I'll wait till it stops moving around a bit. Okay, so it, it looks like there's still a few people giving answers, but it, it looks like we're settling around this sort of 60-40 split, 60% 60 on oral antibiotics and 40% on IV antibiotics. Okay, And that's pretty similar to what we found in our study. So our survey showed that 72%, so slightly higher than here today, would give oral antibiotics. 22 would give IVs. And I don't know, were those gasps about the no treatment? Yeah. <laughs> I know. I feel like there's a few brave, uh, there's a few brave clinicians out there. Yeah. So, um, so, okay. So the next question is, regardless of whether you were going, what you were going to give, orals, IVs, or whatever, would you admit these patients or would you discharge? Okay. Or, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Would you discharge with some follow-up or just discharge without follow-up? Just wait for it to um, stop moving. Okay. So, again, okay, so around 20% of you are saying that you admit. Presumably those are the people who are saying they'd like to give IVs, although obviously there's the option for ambulatory IVs in some hospitals. Um, and 70% are saying they discharge with some follow-up, and a few people are saying discharge without follow-up. Okay. So, again, in our study, it's pretty similar, to be honest, isn't it? So, we had 65% um, would like to discharge home um, with some follow-up. 18% uh, were, were admitting, and uh, there was 12% discharging with no follow-up. We also asked the question, which I haven't asked here today because it, it would be a bit difficult, but um, was whether the answers that these people were giving, if they had a clinical practice guideline, were they, um, were they answering uh, within that? And 24% said no, they would be acting outside their guideline. And I can only assume that's because this is a relatively mild scenario, isn't it? you know, mild case, that like us, uh, where I work, um, uh, they didn't have the option to give orals. Just a few other um, little bits and pieces from our study. We're writing it up at the moment. So uh, we had um, a pretty mixed response rate between district generals, tertiary and children's. 67% of sites said they had a guideline. We managed to get hold of 31 out of 33 of those, which I was pretty um, pleased with. 78% um, of clinicians said that they would discharge home a mild case on oral antibiotics. And of that, there was a real consensus on what they would give. So 96% of people saying that they would give oral comoxiclav. There's also, somewhat unsurprisingly, a real consensus of opinion on things that like proptosis and ophthalmoplegia are like really bad and they would admit, they would give IVs for those, uh, do CTs, etc. So just going back to now some more general points. I think research takes a long time, and I don't think I was really aware of this. Uh, I was you know, pretty naive about this when I started. Um, you need to, as much as you can, just be prepared for it taking a long time and, and plan for it. 
because perhaps I, I, I wasn't aware, and also there's not that much you can do about it, I managed to have a newborn baby in the middle of this project who's somehow shockingly actually turned one last week, which I don't know where that time has gone. Um, but because it takes a long time, I think when the ball is in your court, you need to try and keep momentum going. So you need to try and give yourself deadlines. And also, if you're asking other team members to do things, give them a deadline. This is one thing I learned, um, actually, from Tom, is that when you're emailing people, give people a deadline of when you want things done by, because then even if they don't stick to it, at least they know your expectation. Um, and then the rest of the time, you just have to be patient because you, there's a lot of waiting around. There's you know, waiting for your proposal to be um, reviewed, then waiting for the, the amendments to your proposal to be reviewed. There's waiting for a slot for research, etc. So just trying to be patient. Now, I know for a fact that um, super experienced and really clever people still have to phone a friend for advice. Um, a lot of the time. Now, particularly when it comes to research, I am neither of those things. And so it's been amazing to have people who are much more research experienced than me on in our group, uh, like Tom and Robin. Um, and there's also, Pruki have a policy of having one of the executive committee have to be on each proposal. But somehow, wonderfully, we managed to get two. So we got Mark Little, who is the previous chair of Pruki, and we have got uh, uh, Damien Rowland, who's the current chair. And... Um, their combined support and advice has just been absolutely invaluable when it came to getting a good design um, for the project and um, when it was live, making it a success. Um, so, yeah, I would say ask for help. Just connect with people, whether that be using your research networks, use digital platforms like Twitter. If you connect with people and you ask for help, then it is always out there. You know, people who are involved with research networks love research. They do it because they love research and they want to help other people do great research too. So if you ask for help, there'll always be advice and support and mentorship. You just need to connect with people, ask for help, and then be inspired, really. Um, so I think I was told that... Um, to personalise my approach when it comes to, to research. So 32% of um, email marketing is more successful. Sorry, sorry. Email marketing is 32% more successful if you personalise it with a first name. And so I was told, although I'm not sure we can extrapolate that exact number to PEM research, um, I was told that if I sent personal emails to all the people I was asking to do this study for me, it would really help. So obviously, it takes a lot longer than just you know, sending to a list. But I do think it really helped um, to get our fantastic response rates. And I also then, when I was trying to clean up the data after the survey had closed, so trying to clear up missing, missing um, questions or getting guidelines that hadn't been sent through, again, sending like personalized emails um, is really useful. And of our 59 sites, that were present for Pruki at the time, we managed to get an 83% response rate, which um, you know, I was really pleased with. Now, um, I think, particularly in my projects, in my experience, but I think in a lot of projects you do, you have to be a bit uh, like a dog with a bone. You have to really just keep going to get the data you want. Um, we foolishly opened our study in late November, so it was meant to close the weekend before Christmas. Um, which was not a good uh, idea. So we actually kept it open for an extra month. And, um, and then uh, I, in the new year, I re-emailed all the non-responders personally again and asked, you know, asked them if they could do it. Then I decided a week before, we still didn't have the response rate I wanted, so I brought out the big guns and I got Mark Little to email the non-responders again to see, um, to see if that helped. And that's how we managed to get this 83%. So um, we were really pleased with that. But you just have to, be, you have to be persistent. But I would say you have to be politely persistent. These people are often doing this really for no benefit to them. You, know, you have to um, thank them for their time, be polite, um, make small talk if you sort of know them a bit. Um, so yeah, be like a, be like a dog with a bone, but, but be a polite dog. So in summary... Um, I've learned that uh, you don't need to see people face-to-face -face, um, or know people locally. 
you can use digital media to achieve everything now. Um, use a research network. Their advice is invaluable. Be like Steve Jobs says and be passionate about your topic. Ask for help to anyone and everyone who will give it to you. Be, keep aware of your timeline. Try to move things on when the ball is in your court. Be patient when it's not. Personalise your approach, whether that's with surveys or you know, if you're doing um, a, a multi-centre uh, trial, keep that personal approach with your sites. And finally, be like that polite dog with a bone. <laughs> Um, just like I say thank you and thank you so much to my team and also to everyone at Pruki, to the research steering committee, the exec and finally all the sites who, um, who responded to our question. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was fabulous. Really interesting and some fantastic take home messages. Um, we've got some Twitter questions and if you've got questions in the crowd, um, if you put your hand up, there's a roving microphone and um, we'll, we'll get to you. Um, I was really interested, it's, it's a, s a slight tangent from what you were presenting, but 33 guidelines on the same topic around yeah. the UK. Yeah. Do you think that's an area that um, Peruki could address? Yeah, so, I mean, what we've done with this project is obviously it's just literally a survey and asking for guidelines to compare them. So, you know, we're not developing new evidence, but what we want to show is that this is a common topic, we all deal with it, and we've got all these different guidelines across the mm. UK that are all saying slightly different things. And wouldn't it be sensible for someone, you know, like NICE, to come and do a guideline uh, and just make one guideline um, to, uh, so that we could all follow it? And also maybe to inspire, you know, something like a randomised controlled trial looking at oral versus IVs for these milder cases. Because it, we need more evidence as well. So it would be great if we were all doing the same thing anyway, but we need more evidence to back that up because at the moment it's not there. Yeah, fantastic. Any questions from... From Twitter. Thank you very much for all of your comments and questions on Twitter. Um, so we have Matty Rubens, who has asked, how does Muriel think that trainees can best get involved in research when they're moving trusts every mm. six months? And is the end of training too late to join the club? So, to speak? so yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's one of the things, isn't it? It's hard um, to know how to get involved. And that's why I would say try and get involved with a research network, potentially, that isn't um, linked exactly to your training. Because if you're doing something locally within a hospital, it's so hard if you're then moving every six months or whatever. But if you do something sort of either with your university locally or with a research network, then it, it's kind of above that training, so it can, it, you know, it's overarching. The other thing is to get to ask people within your um, within groups you're on. So if you are on a deanery group, you know, I'm on an EM deanery group, WhatsApp group. I'm on this PEM UK group. If you're on groups like that, just put it out there. Is anyone doing a project and need any help? Um, you know, can I get involved with anything? Because you'd be surprised, people will probably respond positively and say, oh yeah, you know, do you want to do this with me or whatever? Um, so I think it's, it's connecting, even if you don't need, know people personally, making those connections. And we have another question from Edward Snelson, who asks, does Muriel think that there is scope for Peruki to actively seek guideline or practice mismatches to identify areas of practice that would benefit from further research? For example, I think this is probably a bugbear for a lot of people, isolated ongoing vomiting in otherwise well-injured children. As what, like, something we don't have a guideline on. Is that something that oh, we right. would look into creating guidelines for or, or standardising yeah, um, practice for? So, sure. I think um, that's a really interesting question. And I think Peruki is always trying to expand and develop what they do. You know, it's a relatively young um, network. Um, so, yeah, it, might, it may well be something that they, um, they would look into in the future. And, uh, you know, I can certainly take it to them now. I'm sort of on the board as the trainee member as something that, would, that might be interesting. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any questions from the crowd? No? Okay. Well, thanks again to Mariel. <laughs>